Hey guys, my name is Henry Tong and I'm a documentary filmmaker. I make documentaries about art, inspiration and the creative process through interviews with some of the most inspiring creators that I can find. I love learning about how other artists create their work and I've got a documentary series called Makers Who Inspire on YouTube. Thanks so much for making the time to hang out and welcome to Creator Sessions. This Creator Session is really special because it's with one of our very own creators, one of our newest team members and a huge part of Creator Sessions, Henry Tong. Henry is a documentary filmmaker who's been making films since he was 16 years old. He's been nominated and won several awards in his relatively short career. I knew when this series started that I wanted to share his gift and his work because he's so talented, but also because after having the opportunity to work with him week after week, I'm continually blown away by his professionalism, creativity, but most importantly, his drive. He made his way from Adelaide, Australia to New York City in 2019 to live out his dream in what he describes as the greatest city on earth. And it was his drive that ultimately brought him to us as our documentary filmmaker. In this creator session, Henry is going to talk about his series, Makers Who Inspire, which is truly an incredible gift to the creative community. This particular episode and its subject is so relevant right now as our country is navigating another very intense presidential campaign. And its subject, Ben Baker, is one of the few photographers to have been given the honor of photographing the most powerful people and politicians in the world. So I've edited so many of these Creator Sessions episodes that it feels very strange to be on the other side of the lens, I guess. I'm a documentary filmmaker and my work is all about bringing the stories behind how creative work was made to people. So this Creator Sessions episode is quite meta in a sense because I'm explaining my work to you, which in itself is supposed to be explaining how creative work is made to my audience. So I have a documentary series on YouTube called Makers Who Inspire. Uh, and I started Makers Who Inspire because I've always been fascinated by the creative process. I love learning about how other artists create their work. And I really wanted to have my finger in the pies of all of the other creative industries. I started the series uh, in 2016 when I was 20 years old. And as a young filmmaker, it was quite amazing because it allowed me to meet and learn from other creators. Even though we do very different things, I found that I could still take things that they were saying from their specific industries or creative practice and apply it directly to my filmmaking. A lot of the things I ask my subjects and a lot of the things that they talk about are things that I would like to learn and also happen to be things that I think my viewers can get value out of as well. So the film I'll be breaking down today is my film about Ben Baker, a political portrait photographer. Um, it's not one of the highest viewed films that I've done, but it's one of my favorites. Even though I made it three years ago now, uh, I think it's still one of my best works to date. So I'll be breaking the film down into three parts. Um, I'll be playing each part first and then explaining what went into that um, so that you don't have to sit through the whole thing in one go. So here is the introduction to the film. For me, it's a dance. My photo shoots are a dance. I know the steps. I know that they don't know the steps generally, and I know that they probably don't want to do the steps, but I have to go through it with them. It's actually interesting, so it feels like there's a couple of brains, which is what most photographers are doing. Filmmakers are probably doing it. Everyone's doing a different work, but I'm talking to them. I'm listening to them. I'm looking around the room at their PR team. There's people trying to prevent me from doing what I want to do. And we've also got a technical part of the brain. I'm always thinking about the next shot. This setup, that setup, this setup, this setup. A magazine editor can only get me so far. They get me in the door. My job is to get past that door. I love what I do because I think it's the greatest job in the world. It's a great privilege to be able to walk into a room with a camera 
and get people to open up, to listen to stories and learn about life. And at the end of the day, find a moment with someone very important that we can share something that may end up being a piece of history, maybe not. But uh, if I can come away with an image that lasts longer than, than we last, effectively, we've, I've done my job. I'm Ben Baker, I'm a uh, portrait photographer in New York City, focusing on people of power. Uh, I've spent the last 15 years focused on people who effectively run the world, most notably presidents. I've photographed the last four presidents. I work a lot for Politico magazine and Fortune magazine and Time. I get the uh, phone call when they've got someone who doesn't want to give us five minutes, but I've got to turn it into 50 and a whole lot more. All right, so I always try to start my Makers Who Inspire films with an opening introduction or an opening sequence to hook people in. People on YouTube, viewers on YouTube, already have such a short attention span that I think it's vital to try and uh, put together a bit of a sizzle reel of the best bits and the best dialogue uh, to grab their interest and keep them for the rest of the film. This introduction also perfectly encapsulates um, why I was so drawn to Ben and his work. Um, my goal was to use my filmmaking to translate the way that I felt about Ben so that people watching the film would also feel the same way. I wanted to hook people into him and into his work um, just as quickly and as effectively as I was hooked into it when I first found him. So two moments from this opening sequence that I'd consider uh, our hooks are the establishing shots of the US Capitol and the montage of his photos. So the establishing shots pique people's interest because the location and the setting aren't um, locations or settings that you'd commonly see. For example, the subway system uh, that we see in some of the opening shots of the film is actually a internal subway specific to the US Capitol. Many people don't actually know this, but there's a subway that's been built underneath the US Capitol that connects all the different parts of the building to the other buildings that are separate from the US Capitol where uh, staffers and you know politicians and senators uh, all have their offices. So I thought it was important to grab a shot of that because it's something that isn't usually seen um, and I think it could be one of the things that hooks people in because they want to stick around and find out what it is um, and learn more about why he's there. The photos also act as a hook because they show people the breadth and quality of Ben's work. Um, just the faces in the photos that are flashing by are faces that are immediately recognizable. Um, and that's one of the things that really grabbed me about Ben's work, the most recognizable faces that he's photographed. So I wanted to put that in there so that people would want to learn more about how he got to photograph those people. But let me wind it back a little bit. Maybe I should explain how I picked Ben as the subject for this film and how I pick my subjects in general. Generally with my Makers Who Inspire films, I always try and pick people who are inspiring to me, people whose work uh, really speaks to me and people who I am a fan of. So I found Ben because he actually comes from the same city as I do in Australia. We're both from Adelaide. I actually came across his work on Instagram, I think, one of our local uh, publications, City Mag, had done a piece featuring Ben's work, I believe. And when I saw his photographs, I was just so impressed and so inspired that someone from Adelaide, my city in Australia, has created a career here in the United States, in New York City, photographing some of the most powerful and recognizable people in the world. So. I knew that he would be one of the people I would most love to have in my series uh, and I immediately tried to contact him. So I sent him emails uh, on his email address that I found on his website. I messaged him on Facebook, I messaged him on Instagram <laughs> and eventually he responded to me and we managed to set something up. Um, but I really looked up to Ben because not only was his work amazing, um, his journey and his pathway mirrored what I hoped for my life. Someone who spent his formative years in Adelaide, South Australia, and then moved to New York to make a name for himself. I've always loved New York uh, 
and it's been the city that I've most wanted to live in since I was a kid. So everything about Ben and his work that I could see was extremely inspiring and extremely uh, uplifting. And just based on Ben's photographs as well as the captions on his Instagram posts, I could just tell that he's just a very good storyteller, which is, you know, the kind of thing that any documentary filmmaker wants to find. Um, and as you can see in the film, uh, the stories that he tells on their own are fascinating, but the way that he tells them is just as compelling. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the technical uh, parts of this sequence, this opening introduction, the music and the editing. So in this case, you'll notice that the music is a very big part of the whole sequence. Um, it really conveys the drama and the weight of Ben's work. Um, you'll also notice that I time a lot of the cuts to the music. So for example, the camera flashes on Jeff Flake's photograph just as the music hits a note, and Ben starts to smile just in time with a note in the music. The photo reel of all of the photos that he's taken as well is in time with the music, and the cut to black just as Ben turns to look at the camera at the end of the sequence is also time to the music. I think linking the music and the visuals in this way um, grabs people a lot more. And I think people might not consciously think about it, but they do subconsciously notice that a lot more thought and effort has been put into the assembly of the video, the audio. Similarly, I also try to marry the B-roll with the dialogue that's being spoken. So you'll notice um, that what you're seeing is generally quite relevant to what's being said. Like I cut to a shot of Ben walking through a door when he says, they get me in the door. Um, I'm not really sure if people consciously notice it, but I think it really adds depth and relevance to the visuals. Um, this is something I can do because I shoot the interview for my films first. Um, so I knew Ben talked about getting in the door. So I actually explicitly put uh, Ben walking through the door as one of the things that I needed to get on my shot list. One of the things I see a lot of filmmakers do is cut to B-roll or just use B-roll that's not really relevant to the dialogue that's being spoken. Uh, and wherever possible in my films, I just want to try avoiding doing that. You'll also notice that my B-roll style is fairly um, distinct and intentional. Um, when I started making this series in 2016, I really wanted to make it as cinematic as possible. Um, and the way that I shoot my B-roll is a part of that. It's what I consider to be one of the stylistic elements that hopefully makes my work distinct from others. Can I get you guys on that corner? Let's walk over to this side, after this guy moves. When I'm shooting my B-roll, I always try to incorporate a lot of movement into it. I noticed when watching a lot of Hollywood movies, big blockbuster movies, uh, the camera's always moving. So it increases the perceived production quality of the film that you're watching. So in order to try and make my footage more cinematic, I've tried to incorporate a lot of movement into the B-roll that I shoot for my documentaries. Shooting with movement is very good for documenting specific types of art forms, like dance, for example. I made a film about a principal dancer at the New York City Ballet, and this kit was amazing for that because following her movement as she danced around the studio was a lot more uh, immersive than just planting the camera down and shooting it static. So having the movement to document stuff like that is really, really helpful, but even if like, the stuff that I'm shooting doesn't necessarily require movement. Introducing it in a creative way can be very great too. I have to walk like a chicken a lot. I have to squat and compress my knees in order to reduce the shake on the camera. So it's very taxing on my back, lower back and my thighs, but it produces a better looking result. So I either use the gimbal, which is what I've got now, uh, or a slider, or I just go handheld. With Ben's documentary, I, uh, actually used the gimbal mostly and went handheld because we didn't have a lot of time for me to sort of like put the sticks down, put the tripod down and set the slider up. So 
uh, it was mostly this and mostly uh, handheld in the US capital. When I started out making these films, I had shittier equipment. So the internal stabilization on these cameras that I was using wasn't as good and the gimbal itself as well wasn't as good. So the reason that I shot slow motion a lot was because when I slowed it down, any shakiness was half as severe. Um, so it was definitely a more practical decision than an artistic one, but it contributed a lot to creating a sort of an artistic or creative style that set my film slightly apart from a lot of the other documentaries, I think, uh, that are on YouTube. Shooting this B-roll of Ben in New York as well was quite an experience. Um, this trip that I made back in 2017 when I was shooting this film uh, was one of the first trips that I specifically spent a lot of time shooting B-roll on New York City streets. And let me tell you that like shooting B-roll in New York on New York streets is very different from shooting B-roll on Australian streets. Um, there's just a lot more to pay attention to, like cars and bikers and um, just making sure you're not, you're not stepping on anything that you don't want to be stepping on. So I remember struggling quite a bit when I was shooting Ben because I had to have my eyes on my camera to make sure my shot was looking the way I wanted it to look. But at the same time, I had to make sure I wasn't walking into cars or bikers or like, I don't know, street lamps. Um, it was definitely uh, a learning curve, but I'm proud to say that I've done a lot more shooting on New York streets since then, and uh, I think I've gotten a lot more used to it. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to the middle part of the film now, which is what I would consider to be the body of the film. So I photographed uh, President Obama as part of a project for Fortune photographing all the different presidential candidates in 08. And the Obama campaign agreed to a portrait. And finally we got the call that we would go to, to Raleigh, North Carolina and photograph the then candidate who obviously had just won, just clinched the nomination. I photographed him in this stinky cow shed in the back of uh, a fairground. We had quite a great little photo session in there with covers of Fortune. I remember joking to the president, as I always say to everybody, um, great, I'm going to get on the airplane with you. And he laughed. He goes, no, you're not. Okay, I'm gonna get in the car with you. And he's like, yeah, you're not doing that either. But we had a good back and forth and finally I was like, well, how about I just walk to the car with you or wait, I'll meet you outside as we... And he came outside, took his jacket off. I was the only photographer there, obviously, and I was crouched down for a low angle expecting just to get him getting in the car. And he uh, came over and put the finger into the lens and I got one frame and he quickly walked off into the car and was off. And, I remember walking back into the room and the editor, Alex Colo from Fortune, asked me, do you think you've got anything out there? And I, and I knew immediately there was something very special. Through the years of knowing all these great heroes, these um, war photographers, magnum photographers, they always get asked that question, do you know when you took that certain image? And I, think, I don't think most photographers really know. They think they know they're in the middle of something maybe important. But to know the actual moment, um, I knew immediately that something special had happened but it was one frame and the question was, did I get the hand sharp? Did I get the face sharp? Did I get anything sharp? Did it, was, it, was it composed correctly? And um, to my great fortune, it was. The great thing is it's um, been one of the images that has sort of circulated out there and held its place. Um, so when I got to uh, photograph the newly elected president, I went with the editors of Essence magazine to the Oval Office and I brought together a box of gift prints to give to the president and uh, his personal assistant, Reggie, saw that I had two of these prints and he said, do you want the president to sign one of these? And I said, yes, yes, please, that, that would be fantastic. And then uh, delivered to my uh, studio one day here was a box from the White House containing a personally signed gift print from the president with a lovely note. So um, that was a pretty good day. The reason why I'm fascinated and take portraits for people, mostly in politics or in that zone, there are images that will potentially last. I always sort of talk about it in terms of a time capsule. You know, if you had to find a time capsule now and your job was to fill it up with 10 things that define who we are now, what would go in that capsule, right? I don't think a lot of fashion photography would go in there. I don't think a lot of advertising photography would go in there. But I do think maybe, maybe a couple of pictures of people of our time 
will make it into that capsule. I always joke that if my picture makes it onto a textbook, I'll be more than happy. So I photographed uh, the then businessman uh, Donald Trump a number of times for different publications, for Forbes, for uh, Sunday Times of London. This here is on uh, his rooftop here on Trump Tower, and he kept doing these things with his hands. I said, how big is it? I said, how big is it? He's this big. I'm like, I, don't even, I didn't even reference anything. I didn't say how big is anything. I just said, how big is it? This big. How big? This big. And now he's the president. You're photographing high-powered people. They are very different days. Quite often the photography becomes the easiest part of the puzzle. It's a game of chess. It's almost a game of a psychological game. I know the political game really well. I know DC very well. I know those people. I know what they're probably thinking before they do. I can predict pretty well what their answer is going to be based on even keywords I use. But I approach portraits of people of power exactly the same way that I would approach photographing anyone. Um, so you need to approach those people with the same level of respect whether they're the president or the security guard mining the room or anyone you encounter. If you give them that level of respect and listen, you'll be fine. We have stories of moments where it's a give and take. They may be president of the world of America, but um, it's your set. You must always remember it's your set. You need to control, you need to step up and own that space. And they're looking for that. These are people who are controlling people in their own way. Obviously, they wouldn't have gotten to these places if they didn't know how to control a situation. But you have to stand up and tell them what's going to happen and why. I remember there was a portrait with Rupert Murdoch. And I was a really young photographer. It's a picture now that's in the National Portrait Gallery here. And it's him on a balcony. He's there, arms crossed, and he's eighth floor balcony of Fox News looking over Manhattan. And it was for Fortune magazine. And I was a little bit nervous going in. And Murdoch knew I was green a little bit, I guess. And Murdoch just quietly came up and goes, it's your, it's your picture, I'll do whatever you want, mate. I know you're here because you're really good. He was basically saying, get it done so I can get out of here. And it was a really amazing moment of him saying, buddy, step up, you know, you need to own this. It's better for him, he's gonna look better, and you can't go halfway, you, you go for it or not. And if you lose, one day you lose, it's okay. You know? So the first thing off the bat, I think, that you'll notice is that there's a bit of a tonal shift when we transition from the intro uh, to the middle part of the film. There's no background music for nearly two and a half minutes after the intro when he's talking in his studio, which is a really long time considering that the film is only nine minutes and 15 seconds. I initially tried adding music to this part, but I realized that I didn't actually need it. I think it's a testament to Ben's storytelling ability that we can just play the story through without any music. His storytelling was already gripping enough um, and adding music on top of that would have actually detracted from the sequence instead of adding to it. Um, I also think it's a nice contrast to go from the loud and dramatic opening introduction to a quiet and intimate setting like this. I don't know if you noticed this, but one of the things that still annoys me about this whole part where there's no music is that you can actually hear radio signals. New York has so many things going on, especially in Manhattan, that it's very common to hear radio signals in the audio when you're recording a video or recording a podcast. Um, and I still haven't found a way to get around them or to like filter them out. So if any of you have any advice, please leave them in the comments because I would really like to know. And another interesting thing here I just noticed, uh, I forgot this was in the film, but Ben has a great series of photographs of Joe Biden. Um, at the time of shooting this documentary in 2017, he had photographed uh, the last four U.S. presidents. So if Biden wins the 2020 election, he would have shot five. But anyway, uh, you'll notice that there are two different ways that I've shot interviews with Ben in this part of the film. We have the main interview, which is in a more formal, seated environment, which we've seen before in the introduction. And we also have a more casual interview in his studio in Midtown Manhattan. I actually shot the formal sit-down interview in Australia first. Uh, this is how I used to shoot most of my Makers Who Inspire documentaries with one interview that carried throughout the film. But after shooting the formal sit-down interview, I started editing the footage and I realized that there were still a lot of questions that I wanted to ask Ben. So luckily I was going to meet with him again in New York, so I had a second opportunity to interview him. And instead of sitting him down in another studio to do sort of another formal 
uh, piece to camera, I decided to go handheld in his studio and just have him tell his stories to the camera. It felt a lot more genuine and a lot more intimate this way because it looked and it felt like we were getting a peek behind the curtain into Ben's work. Um, we were getting to go into his studio, which is somewhere that most people wouldn't normally have the opportunity to go into. I actually really loved uh, how this ended up um, and this form of storytelling. So I started to incorporate this technique of shooting interviews on location into many of my subsequent films after this. When I was making this film, I also knew that I needed a B-roll of Ben at work. So I talked to him about accompanying him on one of his shoots. He was super kind and super down for it. Um, but the nature of his work is such that he often doesn't know dates or details of his shoots very far in advance. So I just had to cross my fingers and hope that a good one was gonna come up. So I remember I was in New York to film him among a couple of other people for my series. Um, and he called me one day and he said, hey, I might have a shoot in uh, Washington DC at the US Capitol uh, to photograph outgoing senators. Um, would you be interested in coming? And I said, of course, I'd love to come. That would be amazing. So he said, all right, cool. Let's keep in touch. Uh, I'll try to get some clearance for you to come along. Uh, I'll get back to you. So I said, okay. And I think, I think like four or five days passes and I don't hear from him. And then he calls me again out of the blue and he's like, yo, can you send me uh, a scan of your passport? I need to forward it to the government so that they know that you aren't a terrorist. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, sure, that sounds good. So I send him a scan, it goes fine. And then I just don't hear from him. And then I think a day or two before the scheduled shoot, I think the shoot was on a Monday. So sometime on the weekend, he called and he was like, okay, it's all good, all cleared, come on along. So on the morning of the shoot, I hopped on a train um, and I traveled to Washington DC and met his assistant and him at the US Capitol and just shadowed him for a whole day. I have to say that shooting in the Capitol was one of the most amazing experiences that I've had as a documentary filmmaker to date, mainly because just getting to see that place, especially in such a politically charged moment in history was fascinating, especially as an outsider, as an Australian. It's also really exciting shooting documentaries because they give you an opportunity to experience things in the real world that you otherwise wouldn't have access to. Like I would never have an opportunity to go into the US Capitol to photograph uh, US senators uh, if I wasn't making this film. I've always said that I think that the world is an interesting enough place without us having to create new ones. And this whole experience of filming Ben for this documentary is very much reflective of that. All of the things that I experienced and all of the stories that he tells about his career are just as interesting as anything I think that you can see in most movies. I remember Ben actually told me that it wasn't a given that I was going to be able to accompany him for this shoot. I believe he did actually receive a little bit of uh, resistance from Politico, which was the magazine that he was shooting this um, series of photos for at the Capitol when he asked whether I could come along. But he just pulled some strings and navigated client and Senate access, which is something he says is never easy. Another thing about this film with Ben is that he really says some really profound things in these interviews. I've heard them so many times now, so I guess I'm used to, to, to hearing it. But I remember there were so many times when I was interviewing him, he would just say something and I would just be in awe of what he said because he was so eloquent and so inspiring. And it's just the kind of thing that I think you'd only be able to learn or have the wisdom to say um, after many years of experience. Actually, before filming this Creator Sessions episode, I touched base with Ben to revisit his thoughts on our shoot. And one of the things that he said that really stuck with me is that photographers, journalists, and filmmakers always have to find a way. If you don't, no great work will ever be produced. Um, and he also said that no is never no. It's always just the start of a conversation. And that idea has actually really helped me because I remember I was making a film about a fairly high profile 
person who worked at a very um, well-known institution. And there were some questions about whether or not they would be able to take part in this documentary uh, without the explicit permission of this institution, even though they were doing it outside of work hours and outside of the organization. The things that I learned from Ben's shoot and the way that he navigated that client and Senate access really helped me navigate this other shoot that I was doing. It didn't necessarily tell me what to do, but it gave me the confidence to be able to push through and assert myself to be able to get the footage for this other documentary that I was making. Another thing I learned from Ben is how you have to take ownership of a situation um, on set. After hearing his story about Rupert Murdoch, I paid a lot more attention to how he conducted himself on his sets, and he was just always so cool and calm and collected. Even when things weren't going according to plan, he never appeared stressed, and it never felt like he lost control of the situation. He was also always talking to his subjects, like he just never stopped talking. As soon as a senator walked through the door, he would just have something to say. He seemed to know all of the stories of all of the people that he was photographing well in advance of them entering the room. So as soon as they walked in, he had stuff to talk to them about, whether it was a protest that they had just been to or whether it was um, their parents' story about coming to America. It was just, it was amazing. And I could really see that it put these people at ease and helped them open up to him, which was so valuable because um, we didn't have a lot of time with a lot of these people. They were in there for maybe two to five minutes at most, and then they'd be out. So Ben's challenge was to photograph them and get a moment of personality and humanity out of them uh, in that amount of time. And the way that he did it was by just making them feel super comfortable. So watching him do that really made me realize that when I'm on my sets, a lot of the people that I'm filming or interviewing are looking to me to um, set them at ease, even though they might not consciously be thinking that. So after Ben's shoot, I really worked on trying to engage my subjects and my interviewees with consistent and engaging conversation uh, right from the get-go. As soon as I meet them throughout the whole filming process and um, it's really helped me a lot because when someone feels like they're having a conversation with you, it really comes through on camera. Um, people really connect with them through a screen a lot more effectively uh, when they're connecting with you as the filmmaker because you're essentially the conduit through which um, their message is getting to the larger audience or the public or the people that your uh, films are for. Um, so it's something that I think I really took away from Ben's shoot. It's one of many, many things that Ben taught me that I'm very grateful for. So let's move on to the ending of the film. I mean, it's important to have a wide body of work and have different projects that we love doing, just to refresh sometimes. My uh, fiance, former fiance, was a dog fanatic. We wanted to work on a dog project together, and we kept seeing dogs in cones in New York City, and we couldn't contain ourselves. They were the sweetest, funniest, saddest, greatest little dogs in the city. And we started the project, and then we were not together as a couple, but we were still very close. And she was tragically murdered. Um, and very publicly so in a, a very big, uh, very, very public uh, case here in the city. I was purposely pretty heartbroken and put the project away for a while, not really wanting to go there. But then I realized it's actually probably the perfect project to work with her foundation um, and working with some local dog shelters um, to try to raise, ultimately raise some money for uh, dogs who've, uh, who need some help. So that's Cone Dogs, yeah. It's one of the great little projects I do when I travel around the world. I meet dogs who are in recovery in the surf beaches of Sydney or um, the parks in Tokyo or uh, streets in New York City or in um, the Hustler sign in Los Angeles. You know, it definitely shows the joy of how we live our life with dogs, but it's really about a story of us and how good we can be and how much care and how much love we, we give these guys. It just reminds us that we are good. We, we can be good and we can treat and love and show incredible kindness and that should be extended to all animals and, uh, and everybody. So my advice to young creators would be just to do what you love. You have to do what you love. So if you don't love fashion, don't be a fashion photographer. I've got friends who are great architectural photographers and they love architecture. 
They love buildings, they're fascinated by it. So wake up every day, if you're gonna do it every minute of every day, in an increasingly competitive, saturated, crazy universe, do what you love and keep being curious, keep learning, keep learning, keep learning, because this world is changing so quickly. You're gonna need to keep evolving, you know, faster than the next person and keep building. And what you did today, really, congratulations, but you need to be able to do different things to keep moving forward, you know? So a funny story about this whole part of the film, I asked him how he finds these dogs that he photographs and he says that he just goes on Instagram and he messages people who have dogs with cones on their heads at that time in that city that he's in. Many people who own the dogs that he's photographing never actually find out that he also photographs presidents. <laughs> so. They sometimes ask him if he's just a pet photographer and he's just like, yeah, I like, I like to take pictures of dogs. <laughs> and he doesn't ever go into any of the other stories of the other people that he photographs. And I think that is the thing that was really representative about that part of his work for me. Um, I don't think he does it for any other reason than to unwind after working with such high powered people. I genuinely think that after shooting in a very high stress situation for a very big client, Ben just likes to unwind um, by photographing dogs in cones. <laughs> and I think it's fascinating because it, it feeds into his other work. Shooting the dogs recharges him to shoot politicians or presidents or celebrities. It's very interesting. The reason I chose to finish the film on this note is because I think after the big grand and global scale of the work that we cover in the previous parts of the documentary, I thought it would be good to finish the film with a more personal story and project to Ben. I think narrowing in on his personal life uh, felt like a great way to end the film after talking about presidents and politics because it just shows that everyone has to have a side project and everyone has to have something that they do outside of the main work that they do. And it also made him a lot more relatable, I think. Not that he needed to be more relatable because he's already super chilled and down to earth, but I don't know. I think it's just a really nice way to finish a film about someone that would be perceived as being very lofty in where he's managed to get in his career. So I learned a lot of things by making this film. Um, I learned a lot from Ben that I implemented into my own practice. But I also ended up um, making a great friend in Ben, and he's become a really great mentor as well. This film was also a huge part in helping me get to where I am now. Like I mentioned, I've always wanted to move to New York. It's been a dream of mine since I was really, really little. Um, and coming here to shoot that documentary with Ben was one of the opportunities that I had to come to New York before I moved here. I just up until I moved here um, in 2019, I had been coming here nearly every year for the five years preceding. And every time I came, I tried to give myself something to do. I didn't have work here, but I tried to create shoots for myself or create projects to work on when I was here so that I could, you know, get to know the city better, meet new people and uh, grow my networks in New York City. And this film was a really great way of doing that. Um, it gave me something to do when I was here. It exposed me to new experiences and new people. And uh, it really helped me uh, when I eventually did move here because it just so happened that this film was also one of the films that I used in uh, my interview process with ConvertKit. Because when I got my visa to move to the US, uh, I was connected with ConvertKit who, was, who were looking for a filmmaker to make a documentary series for them. And when, they, when we were speaking to each other about this project, they asked me to send them an example of a film that I've made that I'm particularly proud of and explain how I made it and why I made certain decisions behind some parts of the film. And I chose this film because I'm still very, very proud of it. Um, and yeah, a lot of the stuff that I talk about in this Creator Sessions episode uh, are things that I talked to with Isa, the storyteller at ConvertKit, um, when we were collaborating to figure out uh, whether I could work with the company to make the series that 
they wanted to make. So it's just a very special film for me and it's uh, been very foundational in helping me get to where I am now in New York and in my career. So I'm just very grateful to Ben and I'm very grateful for every opportunity I got to be able to tell the story. Thanks so much for making the time to hang out with me. Um, if you want to see more of my work, you can just look up Makers Who Inspire or just search my name on YouTube. Um, and thank you to ConvertKit as well for featuring me in this episode of Creator Sessions. We've had and will continue to have amazing creators on this series, but what an honor it was to have one of our very own share more about his work. Our CEO, Nathan Berry, and Barrett Brooks, our COO, constantly remind us through mostly action that in order for us to best serve creators, we must be creators ourselves. To close this session out, I thought it might be fun to share a few things that our team has to say about our favorite filmmaker. I'm Haley, and thank you for joining us this week on Creator Sessions. Henry, it's always been our vision at ConvertKit to make creators the hero of our brand and to tell stories that honor their work, really, and that bring it to life and that help uh, not only our company but and not only our customers, but really everyone out there in the world see how serious we are about helping creators earn a living. And I don't think there's been a purer embodiment of that than the films and the stories that you and Issa and the whole crew working on creator stories have managed to create. So I'm so thrilled to have you on the team and I'm really looking forward to all of the great work y'all will do together in the years to come. I love working with Henry because he's so helpful, talented, and kind. Having Henry on our team has been so wonderful. From the very beginning, he dove right in, was ready to get involved and lend his voice and just really help us to better understand what creators are facing right now. As, as our newest team member, that voice has been invaluable. I love Henry. He is one of the nicest, kindest, one of the most creative people I've ever met. He's super genuine and just really easy to connect with. I love having him on the team. I love working with Henry because he is a true artist through and through. You'll know this if you've seen any of the work that he's produced. And I think it's wonderful that we have him on the team at ConvertKit because um, at ConvertKit we make software for creators. We make software for artists to help them earn a living. So it's really important to have that perspective represented on the team and we definitely have that with Henry. We're very, very lucky to have him. Um, he brings a great viewpoint to things and uh, like I said, he is a true artist making beautiful things and it's just really exciting to have him um, on board full time to be giving us that perspective uh, and to have him full time on the team creating his art. Henry, you're wonderful work to work with. I love, love working with you and uh, looking forward to many projects in the future.